Light bulb moments, that's what it's all about. And a light bulb, of course, at this city of Philips, has a magical meaning. And a light bulb means a bright idea. And ideas, where do they come from? They come from the brain. And the brain is today actually being discovered in a way that you won't believe. We can look inside the brain at incredible resolution. We can see what the brain is doing. We have deep learning, etc. And that's what I will talk a little bit about today. What is in this brain happening? I'm working at the university, and my field is pattern recognition. I designed with my whole team automatic software to find tumors, patterns, in lots of medical images. And the best pattern recognition machine is this guy. That's an amazing pattern recognition machine. So how do you design all this? And I said, OK, let's be inspired by this brain. Let's see what's in there. So inside is this magic thing, Eureka. And I want to take you on a journey. What do we know? How can we learn from this? How can it, be, how can it inspire us? So let's start with some facts of our brain. It's incredibly small. It's only about a kilo, 2% of our weight. It uses a lot of energy, 20% of our energy. And it has an incredible amount of neurons, 86 billion. And the nerve fibers, they're all connected to each other, all these nerves. Spider wire thin, micron thin. All the wires together is more than to the moon and back. The connections between these uh, neurons are called synapses. We have an amazing amount of synapses, and it's a computer outperforming all our other computers. They have calculated it's about one petaflops, floating points operation per second. So let's put it a little bit more in perspective. <coughs> if you see the uh, trees in the Amazon forest and the neurons in your brain, it's about the same number. If you look at the neuron, it has connections. One neuron is connected to 50,000 other neurons. So that's quite a broad spread out. And if you look at these synapses, and we have trillions of these synapses, how do we learn? If you use a synapse many times, it gets bigger. And if you forget, it gets smaller. So by repetitive action, you learn. So we can also now see how this learning can be done. And one of the amazing feats of our brain is that this guy is only using 25 watt. And that's quite stunning. And if we look at our computers today, we look at these Google data center centers and all these computing and Amazon <laughs> computing centers, they use megawatts. They have cooling towers on top. And that's a waste of energy that's just incredible. So we should learn so much more from this, this brain. So how is it wired? How does it work? What do these functional circuits actually do? And we have a community now in the world that's really focusing on, can we mimic this brain? use this incredible computing algorithms and then apply them in our clever technology. I go a little bit deeper in that. Let's first study the brain. How can we measure this? Well, the first of all is anatomy. And one of the biggest companies in the world making all these fantastic machines is right here. It's Philips. It's in the top three. They make MRI machines, CT machines, etc. We can now see the brain in incredible resolution. The resolution is now about a quarter of a millimeter. So this is called an MRI scan. And this is my own brain. Slice by slice, you can see every quarter of a millimeter in this brain. You see in the middle, there is the spinal cord connecting all these fibers to my muscles, to my heart, to everything. But this is not only we can see. We can also see function. And how can we see function? If a brain cell is active, suppose I do like this, then my motor cortex is active. And these cells, they generate action potentials. They need oxygen, they need food. So they give a signal to the small capillaries, to the small blood vessels, open and bring me oxygen. And oxygen can be seen on an MRI scan. So you first do nothing, you make a scan, and then you do this. And if you take the difference of these scans, you see a tiny difference. And now you see this boy is looking at the screen, he's using his visual system. And the back of our brain is for vision, and you see that quite a lot is for vision. A quarter of our brain is for vision. And if you see how many nerve cells we have, so how many filters, how many calculations are done, vision is an incredible thing. We are purely visual machines. Because images came on the internet, it exploded. 
we do nothing else than look at images because our brain is made for images. We are images machines. So we have functions. We can do more. We can also look at connections. How can you measure connections in the brain? Well, they found some years ago that you can measure in an MRI scan the very tiny motion of water molecules. They make the magnetic field to the left a little bit different than to the right. And if you move a little bit, they change the magnetic field, they change in frequency. And if water is just surrounded by water, it goes in every direction. You see a little bit like a sphere. But if water is in a nerve fiber, it can only move along the nerve fiber and not so much the other way. So if you look for some time, you see a kind of an ellipsoid. Well, the long axis of the ellipsoid is, of course, the direction of the fiber. And what you can do in every voxel you measure this, millions of voxels, you connect them, and then you get the wires. And in my group, we studied this for a long time because we really wanted to see how is this whole brain wired. And also, especially for neurosurgeons, they need to see what are the major tracks. If you remove a tumor, you don't want to make the patient blind or paralyzed. You, you need to prepare all this. So what we did is uh, we made fantastic uh, visualizations. We programmed this on the GPU. You see the fibers here connecting the left and the right in the brain. The colors are X, Y, Z is red, green, blue. So we have some color coding as well. This can now be done for all the areas in the brain. How we hear, how we see, how we move. So we have now the, the wires of our electronic, electronic schematic. And the visual system is the most studied of all. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper in the visual system. They made all these measurements, and they looked, how does it work? And it turns out they are in stages, about 11 stages. And these stages have a name. The primary visual cortex is stage number one. That's in the back of our head. It's called V1, then V2, V3, V4. They are connected. You see the connections. And these layers, we can model these layers by looking at, let's model <coughs> one neuron, and then model thousands of neurons, millions of neurons. And the modeling goes by modeling these synapses. And these synapses are connected by what we call weights in a neural network. Everybody has heard about neural networks, artificial intelligence, that's exactly what we do. What we actually do is we mimic all these connections, what happens in the brain. And people made these neural networks. You see a three-layer neural network. And what you put in, this network has to be a classifier. You put in lots of images, and the network has to say, what is it? Is it the cat? Is it the dog? Is it the horse? But these neural networks were actually, for years, not working so well. It was terrible. It was 75, maybe 80 percent. And that's not good enough. So we struggled. And we had major competitions. In 2010, we had these big yeah, Google images coming up. We had access to millions of images, and people started to make competitions. And they said, OK, send in your program. We have here 1.2 million images, 1,000 classes. Is it the horse? Is it the beach? Is it the building? And people were in about 2010, 75% correct. And today, we are 96%. Because what happened, it was about 2012, People had a major invention, and actually that invention was you should not take three layers in a neural network, but you should take many, many more layers more. Not only 10, maybe go to 20, maybe go to 100. And that's called deep. So that's what we call deep learning. We can train these networks. And this network was, uh, yeah, what is the network like this doing? Stage one is doing very simple things. It has only filters to find some lines, some edges, very primitive things. The second stage is doing some more complex things. So these lines are now triangles, so it finds noses, eyes, and so on, so parts. The third one finds objects, finds a face, and so on. So you get more contextual areas if you go deeper in the brain. What made it especially happen? Well, <clears throat> we have now really amount of, enormous amounts of data. We don't talk about millions of images, we talk about trillions of images. So that's what we call big data. We also have GPUs, graphics processing units. 
that's actually a game card. People wanted to play games, and if you play games, you have to generate all kinds of 3D uh, artificial environments, and the computers were not fast enough. So they said, OK, let's make many small parallel computers, one computer per pixel, and then we can generate 1,000 pixels at a time. And that's exactly what everybody wanted to have, so it costs nothing. A GPU is in every computer now, and it's actually a small computer with 1,000 processors in there. And it costs 50 to, to a few hundred euros. It's made here by ASML. They make the machines who make it. So that's now available. And the third step is, of course, we realize that we can have deep neural networks. And there's a huge community now. It's exploding. And the trick is, of course, to the upper right, you see the visual system. In the middle, you see these, all these layers these layers, and we see an increasing context. But let's go a little bit deeper into the brain. What do they find in vision? If you cut the brain, you see that it is actually, it has layers, it has lots, it's incredibly well organized. Not a single neuron is on the wrong place. And every neuron is used. If you don't use a neuron, it, it degenerates. So people did lots of experiments, they stuck a needle in, V1, V2, V3, and what is the cell seeing? And they saw indeed, if you stick a needle in these very primitive first layers, V1, you saw these very simple filters coming up. It's exactly what's happening there. So in the first layer, we do these primitive things, and in mathematics, we say, okay, we take derivatives. The first derivative is actually the change in intensity. These are edges. Second derivative, how curved is it? So we can do mathematics, and the brain is actually doing a lot of mathematics here. We can also look at how is this formed in the brain? How do these receptive fields, as we call them, these filters, how do they originate? And it turns out you are not born with these filters. If you are born, every neuron is connected to every other neuron in its neighborhood. So how can it get organized? It organizes itself. The first three months after birth, you make them. So that's quite exciting. So we said, let's look at an image and take a monkey. 100 million years ago, what did the monkey see? A forest. So I took a forest image, and you take some very tiny <coughs> patches from the forest, and you do some statistical mathematics, what is the best basis for all these patches, and you find exactly the same filters. So you can learn the filters from the data, and that's exactly what we do. So I said, suppose I'm an animal and I live in a restricted world. I have only vertical lines. It turns out that I, I don't, you get very specific filters, restricted filters. So nothing happens if I go up down, but a lot happens in this direction, so I get the right filters. So the lesson is that handcrafted filters are out. For many, many years, me and all my colleagues, we worked with, let's design a lot of filters and do pattern recognition and so on. That's over. We learn them from the data. We regulate the visual environment by keeping kittens in complete darkness from birth. This is an experiment Bringing with a kitten. Bringing them out for periods of controlled visual experience inside special... Special cylindrical chambers. This kitten, they did the experiment on how was it formed after birth. So the kitten was raised in the dark, and for three months the only thing it could see was the same as I did with the trees, horizontal lines. Can you turn off the sound from the next uh, slide? Because let's now see what the kitten has seen. If the kitten sees a horizontal stick, it perfectly sees a horizontal stick. And of course you expect it. If there's a vertical stick, it has no filters in its brain to see a vertical stick. It cannot see it anymore. So that's quite striking. This is what biology does. This is what's called brain plasticity, adaptivity. We learn from what we see. Well, of course, this kitten uh, went uh, to the family again, and after that, it uh, fully learned its, uh, its all its things. <laughs> the images that we see most are faces. And you know, you look the whole day at faces. Facebook. So when you... <laughs> It even turns out, and they have now found it in, in all kinds of experiments, that we have a dedicated area in the brain that is just specifically meant for faces. It only reacts on faces. 
You give it anything else, it doesn't react, but there's a face, pop, there it goes. And we see faces now everywhere. <laughs> Even in the most stupid things, we see faces. <laughs> so, and why is this? You look at Facebook the whole time. But there's one thing you don't see, and just, just like the kitten, a face upside down you have never seen, so you don't recognize it. You have the same as the kitten. Even if you see a picture of a well-known person, your mother or whoever, it's upside down, you have to look a second longer. Because we have no trained regions for faces upside down. Okay, let's go to some uh, applications of all this, what we learned, especially with this deep learning. One of the big breakthroughs is, of course, the self-driving car. Eindhoven is very active in this area. And why is it actually now becoming possible? We have already cars that drove a million kilometers, because they need to see passengers, traffic signs, all the different things. And this deep learning, this recognition, you remember 96% is okay, is now really working. So it's feasible. It's coming right there. We have in Holland the largest flower production in the world. I think we make about 40% of all the flowers. Nine billion roses every year. And is the we have 450 roses, some are very expensive. Is the right rose on the pellets? Does the farmer say, okay, that's the expensive rose, or is it a cheap one? So we have now computer systems who check everything. And my own field is medical imaging. And that's a huge area. It's big. 80% of all the diagnosis is done on images. And if you make images, you make a CT scan, you easily make 1,000 slices. So which doctor is going to look at 1,000 slices? The doctor needs to be helped by these deep learning pattern recognition systems. And they work. They do an incredible job. <coughs> I'm project leader now of a large screening program with preventive medicine for diabetes. And with diabetes, your blood vessels start to leak. You can't see them. You can't put everyone in an MRI scan. And many people may have diabetes, but they don't know. But your retina, your eye, you can see that very well, and there you can see, with incredible resolution, you can see the blood vessels. And in China, they have an enormous problem with diabetes, 11.6%. So our university, Eindhoven University, has asked, can you help with this huge problem and find in our population who has doubled the amount of diabetes from elsewhere to find them? So we're now running a program. Finally, we hope to screen 24 million people, and our software can now automatically detect the beginnings of small leakages, and so on. And the whole thing is, of course, prevent blindness. So let's conclude. The brain, it's our next revolution. Actually, we have just started. We know nothing yet about the brain. We begin to see it. But we had a major leap a couple of years ago, a disruptive change. Because of these deep neural networks, we will see this everywhere now. It's coming up. Radiologists are going to use it. Everyone who uses computer inspection will use it, and so on. It will be one of the major disruptives. So you saw some examples, and actually now we have a little bit better understanding on where the creativity, where it all emerges. It's in our brain, our light bulb. Thank you very much. <laughs>